The B2 first writing may seem daunting at first, but with some careful preparation and training, your students can get a fantastic mark. I'm Will from Enchanted ESL, and over the years I've prepared hundreds of students for Cambridge exams. And along with the speaking, the writing is one of my favourite parts because students can get so many extra points. So in this video we'll look at the format of the exam, how it's marked, and I'll share my strategies and tips on how you can get your students to succeed. If you haven't already, download a copy of the B2 first teacher's handbook. I've put a link to it down in the description. We're going to be referencing it throughout the whole of this video. Okay, let's begin with the basics. The whole of the writing exam lasts one hour and 20 minutes, and there are two tasks to do, meaning each one takes about 40 minutes. Both tasks are between 140 and 190 words. So when you think about it, an hour and 20 minutes for that many words is plenty of time. So students have to do two writing tasks, but there are actually more than two questions, and I'll explain. Question one is always an essay, discussing a given topic, giving opinions in a formal way. Question two gives the student a choice of three possible tasks. These could be a letter or an email, an article, a review, or a report. In the case of the B2 First for Schools, the report is replaced with a story. Also for the B2 First for Schools, there is the option of doing an essay about a book or a film that they've watched in class, but I have never done this and I don't recommend doing it. Anyway, of all of those possible task types, in the exam there will be three. Let's say there's an email to a friend, an article about music, and a report on a business meeting. The student just has to choose one of them, whichever one they think is best for them. This is great because you can prepare students for tasks that suit their abilities more. And later, in the second video on this guide to the B2 First writing, I'll go over how you can selectively prepare specific tasks and be confident that they'll come up. But now we're going to look at how the writing is marked, so we can prepare a strategy based around getting the maximum points possible. So in the teacher's handbook, we can head straight to page 33 to see the assessment rubric. There are four sections, each with a mark out of five, giving a total of 20 points. The exact same rubric is used for both writing tasks, which each contribute half of the overall mark. So 20 points for question one, the essay, and 20 points for the second question. Remember, in the Cambridge exams, a pass mark is 60%, so students need to aim for at least a 12 out of 20 on each task. But I think we can do better than that, because the first assessment category is a gift. It's content. This assesses whether the student's writing is relevant to the task and if the reader would know all they need to know. In simple terms, did the student answer the question fully without rambling about something off topic? I would expect an absolute bare minimum of three out of the five points on offer here. Students can lose marks if they don't understand the question and start writing about the wrong thing, or if they use too many or too few words. Okay, let's talk about the word limits because this is something all of my students worry about. The question says you have to write between 140 and 190 words, but this is not an exact limit, it's more of a guide. Ideally, they'd write within the limit, but if they have 137 or 194, it's not the end of the world. What's important is whether they fully answered the question in detail without going on for too long. For many students, 190 words just isn't enough, and they need to learn to be more concise and economical with their language. They just need to focus on what is absolutely important. A few rare students find 140 words too many, but this is usually a case of hating writing rather than being able to come up with ideas. What you don't want students to do is worry about one or two words here and there to make themselves just inside the 190 or 140 limit. It doesn't really matter that much. And once they've practiced the writing task a few times, they'll have a good sense of how much is too much and how much isn't enough. Anyway, I challenge all my students to get five out of five in content. If you follow the boundaries and answer the question as you're supposed to, there's no reason why you can't. The next category is communicative achievement. This covers a few different things, but generally it's the style, tone, and coherence of the writing. A five out of five student uses the conventions of the communicative task effectively to hold the target reader's attention and communicate straightforward and complex ideas as appropriate. Well, okay, let's break that down. There's a lot going on there. Conventions of the communicative task. This is the general format and expected dressing of the writing. In an essay, that means having an introduction, some discussion points, and a conclusion with opinions expressed. An email should have correct greetings and introductory phrases. 
A review should have a recommendation, like, I highly recommend you read this book because blah 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 blah. This category also covers the register and tone. It takes into account who the reader is. Register means formal or informal, or somewhere in between. Tone is a little more subtle, but in an email to a friend, the tone should be cheerful. In an essay, it should be serious and general rather than personal and friendly. The first question, the essay is always written for the teacher, and it should be neutral or formal. In the second question, it depends on the type of task that they're doing. They might be very informal, like a review or an article or an email to a friend, or they might be formal, like in a report. So this is something you need to practice with your students, which ones require which kind of language, and what makes informal and what makes formal language. You need to practice that a little bit. The final part of communicative achievement is communicate straightforward and complex ideas. Essentially, are they able to express their ideas clearly, or do they talk in circles or get muddled up? Can you understand the point straight away, or does it require some serious mental effort to figure out what's going on? Another section where I think an absolute minimum of three, and really they should be aiming for a four or a five. The third category is organization. Again, this one isn't too scary, and students can pick up points for things that aren't all that hard. Text is well organized and coherent, using a variety of cohesive devices and organizational patterns to generally good effect. There are three aspects to this. First is using paragraphs. This is easy and most students do it fairly naturally. Generally, each writing should consist of five paragraphs, an introduction, three topic points, and a conclusion. In an essay, it's an absolute must to use this formula. Some of the task two questions might require some variations, like the email or the review, but generally they follow the same pattern. The second thing to look at is the use of a variety of cohesive devices. This means lots of connectors and conjunctions, whatever you want to call them, and ways of gluing the text together and transitioning from one point to the next. Things like because, but, first of all, etc. However, students get more points for using sophisticated ones. Moreover, consequently, saying that, either mm or mm, from my point of view, nowadays. There are loads. My strategy is to give students a few that can fit into pretty much all situations, and then they pick their favourites. Then when it comes to the writing, whatever it's about, they can plug those connectors in as needed. Just be careful that they know which ones are informal and formal. For example, if you wrote moreover in an email to a friend, that would come across really strange. That's way too formal. And as a result, they probably lose a bit on the communicative achievement. The third aspect of the organization category is whether the text is coherent. This is a little harder to pinpoint. Think if each point leads logically into the next. Is there some kind of flow to the writing? If students are constantly chopping and changing, talking about one thing, then another, and then going back to the first thing, that's not very coherent. It's very muddled. However, if you train them to use clear and distinct paragraphs, this kind of takes care of itself. Once again, I don't see any reason why students can't get four or five in this category after a bit of training. And the final assessment category is language. This is usually the part where my students drop most points. But it might not be exactly what you think. There are three sections in the rubric. Uses a range of vocabulary, including less common lexis, appropriately. Uses a range of simple and complex grammatical forms with control and flexibility. Occasional errors may be present, but do not impede communication. So the first is vocab. Range and variety is key here. Encourage students to include a lot of interesting words that they know, and avoid repeating the same word over and over. Same for grammar, a range of simple and complex forms. So they need to include some more advanced structures, maybe a passive or a past perfect, a second conditional or some relative pronouns. They don't have to force a load in though. There's no checklist of, oh, you must use this form and then this form and then this form. No, they should just use them as they see fit. And on occasion, they can prepare a few in advance for specific writing tasks. And most importantly, they don't need to be perfectly correct. The third bit of the language criteria to get five out of five is occasional errors may be present, but do not impede communication. So if you're marking them down, knocking off points for every small mistake, you have it backwards. The Cambridge examiners mark upwards. They give points for each strong and advanced grammar form or vocabulary word or whatever it is. 
instead of deducting points for mistakes. They will penalise some mistakes if they really impede communication and you can't work out what it means, but generally they're looking for good stuff rather than trying to find all of the errors. On page 27 of the teacher's handbook, there's a very important bit of advice. Your student should be encouraged to use a range of complex language. If in doing so they make mistakes, the examiner will always give credit for the complex language attempted as long as the mistakes do not impede communication. So what exactly does impeding communication mean? Can you understand what they're trying to express even though there's an error? If yes, then it hasn't impeded communication. If you can't figure out what they're trying to say because of the error, then yes, it has impeded communication. Notice that in all of this, there's nothing specifically focused on spelling or punctuation. Generally, these follow the same rule of impeding. If the errors don't really affect understanding, they are not penalised. If they do, they are. I recommend you take some time to read over the rubric and get somewhat familiar with it. Now we're going to dig into the tasks themselves, starting with the essay in this video. In a later video, I'll spend more time going over all of the different tasks of the second question. Since students will always do an essay, it's really important you spend a lot of time getting it right. Fortunately, it's quite structured and there's nothing crazy to deal with. Page 29 of the handbook covers in detail what's expected, so I recommend reading that through at some point. And it refers to the sample test, which we'll take a look at. You can download it from the Cambridge website, link in the description below. First, we get the basic instructions. You must answer this one and do it in 140 to 190 words. Yes, we know that already. Then we get a little introduction. In your English class, you have been talking about the environment. Now your English teacher has asked you to write an essay. Write an essay using all the notes and give reasons for your point of view. So this part is always the same, just switching out environment for whatever topic the essay is about. Note that in the first for schools, the topics will be appropriate for teenagers. Then you have the question itself. Every country in the world has problems with pollution and damage to the environment. Do you think these problems can be solved? And there's some notes. These always follow the same format. They give you two and you have to think of the other yourself. So let's think back to the assessment criteria and figure out what we need to do. First, task fulfillment. The student has to answer the question, do you think these problems can be solved? Talking only about pollution and environmental damage in every country. They must also cover transport, rivers and seas, and include something themselves. And do all this with the right amount of words. What they should not do is start writing about something totally different or maybe focusing on local environmental problems instead of global ones. Now communicative achievement. This is formal slash neutral. So not super formal all the time, but you should definitely avoid informal language. It should also be quite general, talking about the topic in a non-personal way. Something like, in my town the transport is very polluting and I don't like it, is not great. The right way is people around the world suffer from air pollution in their towns and cities as a result of transport. That's not to say they can't use personal pronouns like I and me, but it's best when directly expressing an opinion with from my point of view or from my perspective, in my view, something like that. Next up, organisation. Five paragraphs. Always. One is an introduction. In this, the students should set the context and ask the question, not copying directly from the question paper. Then three paragraphs, one for each of the notes, transport, seas and rivers, and whatever extra thing they decide to talk about. And then the fifth paragraph is the conclusion in which they should answer the question by giving their opinion. Okay, let's slow down and focus on each paragraph one at a time. We're going to be writing a perfect essay as a model. You can't expect your students to be writing like this even when they're about to do the exam. You want them to have pretty much all of the parts in place, but the language might not be exactly perfect. By the way, from page 36 of the teacher's handbook, there are six example answers, each marked according to the assessment criteria. When you have a bit of spare time, read all of these through to get a good idea of what students might write and how to handle it. Anyway, let's start with the introduction. We need to set the context and we need to ask the question of the essay. And to be clear, a title is not necessary for an essay. In some of the other tasks, yes it is, but an essay, you don't need one. So we want to write something to introduce the general topic. Nowadays, the whole world has problems with the environment as habitats are being destroyed and our water is contaminated. And then we need to set up the question of the whole essay according to the task specifications. Is the damage too much or can we find a solution? There we go, not too bad. 
Nowadays is a great way to start any essay because they're almost always about a relevant topic today and it's a nice little connector to throw in. Notice in there another connector as and the passive voice, habitats are being destroyed. It's a short introduction, but that's all it needs to be. Remember, students have to be concise and stay on topic. Next paragraph, we're going to talk about transport. Now, just because it's number one on the list of notes doesn't mean we have to do it first, but in this case, we will. The aim of this paragraph is to briefly touch on some key points about transport as a global issue, and ideally offer a bit of both sides of the argument if we can. First of all, transport is a major issue in all nations. Cars and lorries are bad for cities and towns, but we should not forget about the pollution caused by planes too. Even though there are more electric cars these days, they are still a minority. A nice phrase like first of all or to begin with gets some points for organisation. The first sentence is short and immediately tells us what the paragraph is about. And then we can go into some details and finish with a bit of a contrast. There's a positive in electric cars, but not enough yet. Again, this is really short. Students have to think carefully about what they want to say and not ramble on. Something I typically see, which is an example of not being concise, is something like, first of all, we have to talk about the topic of transport. Transport is a major issue in all nations. Notice how the first sentence is mostly unnecessary. There's no need to say we're going to talk about blah, 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 blah. Just start talking about it. OK, the next paragraph is very much the same, and we're focusing on rivers and seas. Moreover, our oceans and rivers are highly polluted with plastic as a result of all the extra packaging and junk we throw away. It stays there and hurts the creatures living there. On the other hand, we have tried to reduce this waste by using less plastic bags. I like moreover as a connector because you can use it at the start of a lot of paragraphs to continue a theme. We have more connectors in there as a result of and on the other hand. And again, a little bit on the opposite side of the argument. Students don't have to do this in every paragraph though, if it doesn't make sense. The third point we have to come up with ourselves. We're going to talk about deforestation. Another serious problem is deforestation. In many countries around the world, people have cut down huge forests to make space for farms and sell the wood, but they don't think of the consequences like destroying habitats and making our world less diverse. Again, another paragraph that follows the general format. A few complex grammar structures in there and the odd connector. And that takes us all the way to the conclusion. The aim of this is to answer the question of the essay by expressing our opinion on it. It's always good to start off with a nice opinion starter. From my point of view, or it is my belief that. And then get straight to answering the original question. From my point of view, the problems we are facing can be solved if people can work together. We already have electric cars and we use less plastic. However, every country on the planet needs to do more to save our world. There's a definitive answer to the question here. I encourage students to give an opinion one way or the other instead of sitting on the fence. It makes the whole explanation in the conclusion a lot easier and more concise. And notice how I referred to some previous ideas in the text. That's an advanced thing, but adds to the organisation score. So here we have the whole essay and, well, would you look at that? 208 words. I've gone over the limit. And that was without going into much detail in each paragraph. That just shows you the problem of the word count. 190 words is hardly anything. Realistically, I wouldn't expect to get penalised for this because I wasn't talking about completely different things or rambling on or making things muddled. However, to be safe, we could eliminate a few things in there, like and making our world less diverse, and reword a few sentences to make them shorter. Still, that's quite a challenge for your students. And it brings up something important. Planning and editing. Students have about 40 minutes for each task. That is plenty of time. Students can think of what they're gonna say, start making a structure and brainstorm some vocabulary before they even write the first word of their answer. Most students just don't do this though. I'm not exactly sure why. I explain to them the benefits of doing it and they're like, yeah, that's a great idea. But then when it comes down to it, they don't bother. Maybe it's because they're still worried about the time limit or they think they can figure it out. They don't need to bother planning. They have it all in their head. Maybe it's a lack of maturity. I don't know. Whatever it is, I highly recommend encouraging them to spend a few minutes before writing to read the question carefully and figure out what they're gonna say. This can make a huge difference. And once they've finished writing their answer, it doesn't stop there. Another thing students fail to do is edit. The amount of silly mistakes I find when marking students' work because they haven't bothered to read it over and check a few things, it's actually quite incredible. But editing isn't just proofreading, it's finding ways to improve the writing. 
Can you change a connector to make it more sophisticated? Is there a more interesting word they could use instead of the one they repeated seven times? Could they even reformulate a sentence to have an advanced grammar form? You might be thinking, their answer paper is going to look a real mess after all that. And it will. That's why they should write the whole thing again neatly. What? Write it all again? But that will take ages! They don't have enough time to do that! Wrong. They do have enough time, and it doesn't take that long, really. To be honest, I don't know a single student who has struggled with the time limit in the writing part of the B2 first. The vast majority finish early and head out if they can, or just sit around doing nothing. But they should use all of those 1 hour and 20 minutes to make their writing as amazing as possible. Once they finish writing their first draft, they should edit it heavily and then spend some time writing out another draft neatly. And then they can cross out the original so that the examiner doesn't read it. Really, it doesn't take very long to write 200 words if you're just copying them. And in the process, they might pick up a few extra mistakes that they missed or think of a few more interesting words. Not to mention the examiner will have a much better time reading their handwriting, because if the examiner can't understand what the letters on the page are, they're not going to get marks for them. Of course, practice within the time limits to make sure students know that they can do all of that in the time. In some rare cases, students are quite slow with their writing, and the 40 minutes might not be enough if they have to copy it and write it all out again. Oh, and here's a tip to avoid having classes where you sit around for 40 minutes where your students are just writing in silence. Set the writings for homework. Make the deadline before the next class. They send you their writings, you mark them, and give them feedback in the next session when it's still fresh in their mind. If they give it back to you like a week later, and then you have another week of marking, they'll forget what they've written by then. Another thing, most students are not familiar with the essay format when they start doing the writing. It's a little bit difficult to get your head around at the beginning. In the past, what I did was explain all of the things that I've just explained to you and said, go do one. And then they come back and they haven't done even half of what I told them to. And I thought, well, why not? You had all of the information. It's not that simple. First of all, it was way too much all in one go. And second, they didn't really have a frame of reference. They needed a model answer. So now I give them one, like the model we just did earlier. And in their first essay, I get them to write their answer to the exact same question, and they can use the model as a guide and inspiration, taking some of the connectors, the structure, even the ideas. As long as they're not copying it word for word, then they can write something that's adjacent. In the beginning, it's like riding a bike with stabilizers. They're not confident enough yet to go on their own, so they need a bit of support. And once they've imitated the model once or twice, they can go out on their own. They're used to it. And after a bit more practice, it just becomes automatic. This is a much quicker and less stressful method than just throwing them in the deep end and expecting them to swim. Cycling, swimming, I've mixed up my metaphors there, but I think you get the idea. And in the description, I'll put the sheet that I give my students with that model essay answer and some guidance so you can use that with yours. Okay, so we've just about covered the essay. Now the other tasks, the ones in question two, follow a very similar formula, but they all have their own unique things about them. So I'll need another video to explain all of that. Oh, and then I'll have to explain how I mark the writings in a really helpful way. That'll require yet another video. There is so much to get through and I'm really excited to share it with you. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel and hit the bell icon so you're notified with all of the new videos about the B2 First writing. And if you're watching this in the future and I've made them already, then there'll be a playlist for you to look at. Oh, and if you found this video helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button. It helps the video spread to more and more amazing teachers like you. So go check out the next video on the writing, which I'll put right here. And if it's not ready yet, then it will be another really useful video for you. But for now, I've been Will from Enchanted ESL, wishing you all the joy and success in your teaching. See ya.